Hi! So in this video I'm going to go over the setup for prep test 67 game 2 and I'm going to focus specifically on the last rule uh, where we see the phrase um, if but only if. Okay so we've got seven professors I have their initials and they're going to give exactly one guest lecture in the literary theory course. The lectures are ordered from first to seventh Right, and their order must conform to the following. Um, P lectures before W, T before S, V before Z, S no later than third. So S is somewhere in the first three, which means T is one of the first two. And Y is not seventh. Okay. And then the last rule, P lectures first, if but only if y lectures before v all right so if you watch my previous video then you'll know that if but only if can be replaced with a double arrow okay so what we're saying here is that if p is first we know for sure y is before v also, if y is before v, we know that p is first. So with the double-headed arrow, both of these are triggers, right? So typically with our conditional rules, we're really concerned um, about making sure that we know what the sufficient condition is so that we treat that as the trigger. So in the statement, if a then b, a, is the sufficient condition and so we're going to treat that as the triggering condition for this rule. This rule applies if A is present. So if A is present then I can cross this arrow and I know for sure the consequence of that is that B is also present, right? Um, and the contrapositive is if B is absent then A is absent, right? If we don't have B then we don't have A. Or if B is not true then A is not true depending on the context, right? So these are the things that are triggers, whereas these are not. These are just consequences. But when we have a double-headed arrow, both of these are triggers, okay? So knowing that P is first, that's enough information to know that uh, Y is before V. And also, knowing that Y is before V is enough information to know that P is first, okay? The contrapositive would be if Y is not before V then P is not first, and if P is not first, then Y is not before V. So either both of these things are true, or neither of them are true. Okay, those are our two options. In this scenario, that's not the situation, right? So if A is true, then B is true, but just because B is true doesn't necessarily mean that A is true, right? So we can't go backwards on this arrow. Same with the contrapositive. If B is false, that means for sure that A is false. But just because A is false doesn't necessarily mean that B is false. Okay. So for this scenario, we actually have three options. Either we trigger this rule by saying that A is in or A is true, then B is also true. That's one acceptable option. We have another option where we trigger it by saying that B is out or B is false, and then that means that A is also out or false. That's another acceptable option. And there's a third acceptable option, which is avoiding these triggers altogether by putting B in and A out, and that would also be acceptable. So the only unacceptable scenario here is having A in and B out, right? That's actually not allowed. That's going to break this rule. Whereas this rule, P is first, okay, that's going to trigger that Y has to be before V, okay, that's one option. If we say that Y has to be before V, then P has to be first, you know, that's going to be the same option, right? So that's 
that's also um, you know, allowed, but it's, it's the same thing, so we don't have to rewrite it. Or P is not first, and then Y is not before V, or Y is not before V, and then P is not first. So these are the only two scenarios that are allowed with these pieces of information. What we can't have is we can't have P being first and Y not being before V. We also can't have Y being before V and P not being first. So these would be unacceptable combinations of, uh, of information here. Okay. So we actually are more limited by this rule than we are by this rule with the arrow going just one direction. So I say that because it's really, really important when you have an if but only if rule that you don't just use a single direction arrow because then what you're going to do is you're going to miss out on extra limitations that the rule is giving you. So you're missing out on potential deductions, potential triggers that you wouldn't have with an arrow just going one direction. And in a similar way, if you look at um, a rule where the arrow is supposed to go in just one direction, right, but you treat it as if it goes both directions, then you're going to be missing out on things that are possible and treating them as if they're impossible, right? So you're going to be adding more restrictions that aren't actually warranted, right? You're going to be going further than the rule actually allows you to go. So we want to interpret every rule correctly so that when we're tested on how does that rule impact the boundaries of what's acceptable in this game, then we get the answers correct. Um, so if you want the simplest kind of, you know, shortcut way of looking at it, then you treat if but only if as a double arrow and you follow the rule that you follow the direction of the arrow and you don't go backwards on the arrow unless you're allowed to with the double arrow, right? Because you've got those, you know, two, uh, two sides to the arrow. If the arrow just goes in that direction, you only go from here to here, right? You don't go the other way. If you've got the double arrow, then we can go from here to here and we can go from here to here and we're good. Okay. okay. Um, Great, so uh, that'll be it for this video. Um, I'm going to talk about the word unless next. That's another one that trips a lot of people up when it comes to conditional reasoning.